Hello and welcome to Leadership is a Philosophy, Not a Checklist, video discussion 9, The Cane Mutiny. Now, this one is a little bit of a hybrid because I've watched the movie a couple of times and I was doing some research just to find out about the author and a little bit about the backstory and uh, saw some comment from somebody that said, hey, the book is really much better because it goes into a lot more detail about the characters and what's going on in their heads. So I decided to read the book. Books, I did an audiobook. It's 26, 27 hours long. And uh, it's absolutely that. So even though it's a fictional story, I have witnessed this sort of behavior in people all the time. So sure, it's fiction, but it's more like historical fiction, <laughs> even though this didn't happen to the actual author. The author was in the Navy. He do, did serve on some destroyers. So as far as the terminology and all that, it's all spot on. Um, and what I like to say is that this is the most exquisite summation of the problem, right? Here's what happens if you put somebody in charge that has no business being in charge and then the impact on everybody around them. So it's not just the one person, but everybody else's life is affected. Everybody else is impacted. The negative ramifications and causes and effects, it's amazing. And then the argument that's done during the trial part of the book after the mutiny is amazing as well. It's a third of the book, I think. And it's just great. It's really great. And so after this review, I highly recommend that you go and read or watch the movie. Books better. Um, with this perspective, because then you start to see that realistically, it wasn't just one guy's fault. Anyway, um, as always, I appreciate your time. And I know that I said I was going to do military civilian. I don't know how I messed up my plan. I'm just following my plan. So we will, uh, the next will be the PowerPoint part. So thanks as always for your time. Alrighty, so here we are, ready to go through the PowerPoint part of the Kane Mutiny. Now, as we talked about during the intro, uh, what I want to talk about first is I'm just going to sort of go through the plot. If you don't want spoilers, then go get the book um, and then or watch the movie um, and then come back and watch this. But I don't think I'm giving away or messing up anything tragic. The movie's been out for almost 70 years. So, okay. So, the reason that I enjoyed this book so much, I remember watching the movie when I was a kid, and I was just thinking, oh, this guy's out of control, he's terrible, he's awful, of course they're absolutely justified to mutiny, blah, 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 blah. Well, now that I've watched it and read the book, you know, my perspective's changed completely and going through this leadership process. So, first thing is, uh, the cane. So the story is told through the eyes of a guy who's outside of the, or he's in the situation, but it's not the captain. It's not any of the other people. So he goes to assume or to take over his first assignment uh, on a ship and the ship's a disaster zone. So this is a pretty good picture of it. And like I said, the book gives you is so much richer than the movie. And so everything is explained so much better. So as a leadership book goes, the book is, I mean, as a leadership subject, the book is far superior. The movie's great, but the book is, is it's perfect. Anyway, so as you can see here, everything's a mess. They got clothes hanging out, there's stuff over the sides, which, you know, they're in port and they're cleaning, you know, and they're trying to air things out, which I get. I mean, I don't know if you've been on a destroyer, but it's not like they're the most spacious, open-aired places. And in the olden days, back in World War II, it went no better. So, but it, in the book, it talks about he, the guy, the lieutenant walks on board. There's trash everywhere. There's comic books on the floor. There's food everywhere. And, you know, the people are walking around with hardly any clothes on. The captain didn't have any clothes on. So it's sloppy, messy it's a disaster, right? It's terrible. Um, and so that's the environment that exists when he takes over. However, the captain is actually a pretty proficient guy. 
he's pretty good at taking care of making sure that the ship the the, the destroyer maneuvers correctly and all that sort of stuff so he's good but the environment i mean if we're going to use the definition he has completely his environment his environmental idea is everything can be a complete mess and the excuse is oh we've been out to sea and been working a lot well uh, you know um where do you think the term is everything ship shape coming from if you're going to be on a ship things got to be clean and tight you know if anything's loose and laying around it's going to be a mess but like i said they're in port and so when you're in port and doing refit you know things look messy i get it so anyway it comes time for him to get relieved and captain Kui gets put in charge now this screenshot is from a little bit later in the movie but um he takes over the ship and immediately walks in and says there's the navy way there's the regulation way and there's my way and my way is the only way it's not a great start right so he kind of starts throwing his weight around and and starts picking on people a little bit and becoming a bit of a of a jerk uh and what is not in the book or the movie is him saying hey he never once communicates what he's trying to achieve so he doesn't say hey look here's the navy standard and we're nowhere near it so we need to get to the navy standard right i've said that several times that if you've got if you're in a, in a company or an organization here's the standards of the company let's meet those and if you're not meeting those then there's a problem right because you can't complain if you're not doing what you're expected if you're doing everything that's expected and still not achieving results then maybe there's something else needs to be tweaked i don't know anyway in here he's kind of laying down the law and doing all this sort of stuff and then proceeds to be kind of a massive jerk you know um he anytime he gets in any sort of a pressure situation he shuts down uh, he gets obsessed about really small, minute details of things that do or do not matter um, and doesn't do a good job communicating with anybody what he's trying to achieve. So all the, all anybody's perception is, is that he's being a tyrant. So that's a problem. Now, this is an image from sort of his first big mistake. Um, they're out towing around targets for other ships to shoot at and he's so obsessed with correcting this soldier for having his shirt tails untucked and he gives the order to turn i think it's to the starboard so he's doing this big circle and cuts the tow line to his target uh, and then blames the navigator and then gets called in because he doesn't recover the target leaves it floating out in the ocean and the officer that calls him in says what happened i heard this and he says nope that's a lie you know, I, I'm offended by your insinuation and all this sort of stuff. And and then this repeats several other times in the story. And like I said, this is like the perfect description of the problem. This is the perfect indicator of a human being or a person that that just that just it, it's a it's a perfect story of somebody who just should not be in charge. So then later on, they get in combat a couple of times, and his first response is to run away from combat. Uh, anytime that there's someone there's taking fire, he's always hiding from the fire. He's doing all this sort of stuff. So what happens is the subordinate officers start talking a little bit of garbage about him, which isn't great. And one of the guys sort of gets it in everybody's head that the captain's insane. And so then he starts talking about symptoms and all this sort of stuff. Next thing you know, um, everybody starts perceiving that the guy's lost his mind and he's being crazy and doing all this sort of stuff. And uh, the executive officer, so the second in command, starts keeping a log of all the crazy things that the captain does. Well, they're not really crazy. They're all decisions made out of fear or all things that are done purely out of self-interest or things with no integrity or actions without empathy i mean there's a couple examples they were going into combat they were in combat everything was crazy so then some of the soldiers uh, soldiers i'm sorry some of the sailors i'm an army guy if i mess up the navy terminology it's not intentional um but they use too much water 
so the captain cuts off water for three days and then he tells the guys that are in charge of the movies that he doesn't want to watch any more westerns and so they're showing a movie on deck captain finds out that nobody told him about the movie and the guy says you told me not to invite you because there was you didn't want to see any more westerns so then the captain cuts off movies for six months it's, it's like there's a whole bunch of stuff no empathy no humility no day right and so all of this stuff repeats and then and then anytime they get in some tense or weird situation captain shuts down um and then pretty soon he basically withdraws and is in his room all the time having meals sent in never seen the executive officers running the ship you know so how's that working out for you so then they come up to the time where whoops too much um so then they come up to a time where they're in a typhoon and the fleet is supposed to be heading south so that's a heading of one uh, one eight zero if you're doing navigational stuff and but the storm is blowing north to south and so the waves are coming north to south now i have always heard that you want to put the nose of the ship into the wind because then you know you're sort of playing off the wind and you can see what's coming and anyway what happens is captain Quig says we need to follow the fleet and go south even though the waves are huge and the ship is wallowing and all this sort of stuff but because of the nature of the storm they can't turn very well and the engines aren't re aren't responding very well and so now the ship is broadside to the waves which is definitely bad because the waves are big enough they're going to knock the ship over it's healing falling over all this sort of stuff well eventually the captain is it, it shows the picture he's basically got this death grip on a piece of machinery on the bridge and doesn't say anything except for go south and they said look we need to put water in our we need to ballast the tanks which is fill up some tanks full of water so that the ship rides lower so it's not such a big signature face into the wind and the captain just keeps saying go south and he's just locked up well finally the xo relieves him says you're relieved you've lost your mind and then turns the ship around ends up rescuing some other sailors from another ship and then they get out of the storm so what is interesting is in the book it doesn't really show it in the movie it shows it a little bit but afterwards captain quig says look let me take command again put me you know let me let me be back in charge we'll just forget about this whole thing well it's because he's trying not to get a bad record on his on his um on a, a bad record a bad mark on his record so Kiefer is the XO. Kiefer says, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you command back. But, you know, obviously I'll surrender when I get back into when we get back to the fleet or whatever. So then they get back to the fleet, and then this is where things get goofy in my mind. Um, they get back to the fleet, the story comes out about what happened, and they leave Kiefer in charge of the destroyer and take Quig and reassign him somewhere, pending the court martial. But they leave Kiefer in charge. Why would you do that? Anyway, so then they go and have a trial. And in the trial, basically, Kiefer says he's not guilty. And then they go through and prove that basically Quig is unfit as a commander, not insane. And so Kiefer gets acquitted. But basically, it's from some, some making Quig look really bad rather than defending what happened with, um, with Kiefer. So... That's sort of the story. Like I said, the book, if you get the audiobook, it's 27 hours. <laughs> Big book. But it's a really good book because it's just excruciating in its detail. And not excruciating, it's just the, the story is great. It's just great. And then it lays out everything. And then there's arguments that are that pro and con that are excellent. It's just, it's well worth reading. Anyway, so here's, so here's the four levels of leadership failure. Okay. So first, senior commanders. So the senior commanders placed Quig in command. Now, <clears throat> there was a failure of every officer before these guys in this situation because they gave Quig a fine fitness report. Somebody who shuts down under pressure, somebody who has an issue doing the right thing, somebody who's, you know, 
is is only makes decisions in self-interest doesn't just start doing that after 18 years in the Navy. They've been doing it the whole time. So why did he get a fitness report saying that he should command? Anyway, they place Quig in command. And then when they've got, you know, the, the couple of officers that are senior, when the whole incident happens with him cutting the tow cable, they go, eh, I don't have a great feeling about him, but, uh, you know, I don't have a great feeling, but we've heard this thing and he absolutely denied it up and down. I have no reason not to believe him. Well, that's not paying attention. And then I don't know. I mean, I guess it's a Navy thing, but it seems to me that even if somebody's on their own ship, a command, you know, somebody who's the boss needs to go check stuff. Go over there and spend a couple of days on the ship just to see what's happening, you know, see what's going on, see how things are running. Because if the guy's a good leader, it doesn't matter. If there's a problem, you're going to see the problem. So anyway, senior commanders allowed this to happen, right? I mean, they allowed this situation to exist. So there's the first part of the problem. But like I said, this is all put together. So Commander Queek, so he didn't have a leadership talent and he didn't have the hypothesis. I mean, not hypothesis, the philosophy or the four characteristics that we talk about of a leader. He didn't have any humility because he's, you know, my way or the highway. He didn't have any integrity because he lied about everything. Um, then he didn't have any empathy because he just was crushing people's souls. He was canceling passes, canceling leave all the time. Um, and then he didn't have any vigilance either because he wasn't sitting around trying to figure out stuff. So everyone, every time he made a decision, his decision was made from fear of getting a bad mark. So... His, his calculus was not what's the right thing, but what's going to not get me in trouble. And if you start making decisions like that, what happens? First thing that happens is you're going to get in trouble, right? Uh, and then the junior officers were the next part of the problem. So they didn't speak up, even, even though, you know, I, I've, I've uh, talked to some Navy people, and I know that the skipper is the king of the ship. Fine, but you, you still should say stuff so that everybody understands what's going on. So they didn't speak up. Uh, there was a situation where um, I think it's the first time that Captain Queeg got nervous and ran away from a fight. He got everybody in the wardroom and said, hey, we're sort of like a family. We need to help each other out. Does anybody have anything to say? And my interpretation of that was that he was sort of asking for help and everybody just sat there. Nobody said, hey, you know, here's some stuff. It's like you missed your chance to, to do something. So they missed an opportunity to help out. But then the other thing they didn't do was they didn't take care of the sailors despite what the captain was doing. So there's a couple of situations like where they um, banned, where the captain banned water that one of the officers went in and said, hey, can we give the guy some water now? You know, can we do this? Hey, maybe can we do movies? And the captain was like, oh, you guys are just out to get me, trying to make me look evil, all this sort of stuff. But still, they should have been doing everything that they could to take care of the sailors, no matter what the commander was doing, right? And then especially when things got to where the captain was locked himself in his cabin for, I think it's a couple of weeks it talks about, or a couple of months, he was barely seen on the ship. Well, and just slowly get things back to where people are being taken care of. So that's the other issue, right? And then De Vries, who was the commander in charge of the ship when they took over, well, he didn't enforce standards at all. Like I said, there's just the ship was a disaster zone. And that's a problem, right? So that means that he might have had the leadership talent because he was able to make sure that people sort of were doing their job right. But then letting everything be a mess as well is just dumb, right? So this is sort of an interesting point because there's a couple of instances at the beginning where he's teaching the, um, the main character of the book. He's teaching him a lesson. So he's got some vigilance and he's got some empathy and he's got some integrity, but he's allowing standards to be a disaster. So that's 
that's the problem or that's what can happen if you let somebody who's got everybody in love with him or her um, be in charge without checking on them. Because, you know, I, I don't know the Navy, but I know if I was in an Army unit and, and I took came in and everything's trash and mess everywhere and everything looks like junk, that that's going to get fixed, right? Things are supposed to be clean. It's just, it's, that's a human thing. Um, and so you can't say, oh, we're, we're working so hard or, you know, we've been so busy that we can't maintain discipline. I mean, there were some battle drills that Captain Quig ran when he got in charge where guys weren't wearing their life vests or their helmets. Well, that's all protective equipment, right? You get blown off the ship, you need your life vest on. I mean, it's, it, we talked about it before. You need to make the job as easy as possible while still accomplishing the job. And safety is one of those things, right? Yeah. And it's not safety paranoid. It's we're going to do this and we got to do it and protect everybody to the best extent possible. I've done some pretty crazy things in the military, not as crazy as others, and we did them all safely. Even though they were inherently dangerous, we mitigated everything that we could so that we still got the job done. Um, and so I would say that he lacked humility in that you know, his thing was, well, I, you know, I, nobody's going to tell me that I'm doing wrong because I'm letting everybody relax. I don't know. So, so was the, was the fact that they mutinied correct? Well, no, right? But what's the solution to the situation? Well, the solution to the situation is Quig should never, had no business being in charge of anybody ever. He had no business being, doing that job. He should have never been put there because what happens? You take somebody who's got no, none of the characteristics of a leader, doesn't have the leadership talent, and put them in charge in a pressure situation and everybody goes into survival mode. So instead of inspiring confidence and trust and doing all the right things and making sure that everybody was involved, he alienates everybody, pisses them off, self-serving, doing all the terrible things. So then everybody makes bad decisions because there's no example of good, right? There's no example of good. And, and you know, I'm sure, I, actually, I know that there's examples of really bad decisions that officers have made in the Navy causing accidents in ships and stuff like that, where they wouldn't listen to anybody in their subordinate unit or in their, uh, their subordinate leaders, even though they were telling them the right thing to do, you know? Don't turn this way, turn that way, or we're going to have an accident. Shut up, you. And they turn the wrong way and get in an accident. So that's the issue. So then let's go back to the senior commanders. Where's the, where's the evaluation system that actually has integrity? You know, if you make the evaluation system so crazy that it's like, if you're not going to get promoted unless you have a perfect rating. Okay, so then, so then everybody gets perfect because we don't want to be the person that says no. No, it should be, here's what you're going to be good at. So you're going to get promoted and do those things. And you're going to get evaluated off of those things. But then we also need guys that are really good technicians. So let's find the person that's the technician and make sure that their ratings say that. And then they get rated on, on their technical expertise. So, yeah, so the, so the answer is, is that leadership failed above by putting Quig in charge. And the reason he was able to be in charge is because nobody said this guy's got problems. And they should have, right? If you really care about integrity and really care about what the Navy's going to do, or not the Navy, but what the, what the sailors are going to have to go through, then, you know, the commander, he had no business being in charge. And then the support, the junior officers didn't do anything either. They didn't band together and just try to do their best in spite of the commander. And then, like I said, the other, the opposite example is somebody who actually was good with people, but then let them go to crap. The, the thing that's uh, uh, obnoxious about DeVries in my, or DeVries in my opinion, is that everybody thought he was awesome. People listened to him. They really respected him and all this sort of stuff. Well, then go out and use that to get people to do the right thing. 
I want people to be protected, right? So anyway, so that's that's what I think is amazing about it. And like I said, the book explains all of that so much better. And then the great part is at the end, uh, after the trial, the lawyer that was in charge of the trial goes in and sort of choose all the junior officers butts for not being loyal and for talking smack and the guy that sort of instigated all of it and got everybody thinking that they needed to get rid of him he didn't get touched <laughs> so it's a it's a interesting scene but like i said movie is worth watching the book is way 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 better i mean you go through and read the book and you just come away with the fact that he had no business being in charge so all the systems around him failed Right. Shouldn't have never done that because then none of those situations would have happened. And this guy here was a, you know, was pig pen and should have been checked on. So I blame the senior leaders. Of course, it's all fictional, but it's when you read it, you would think it's absolutely real because it's so correct. Right. OK, um, so this is the original movie poster for the K-Mutiny. I thought that would, it was kind of cool to see. It came out in 1954. Um, and then this is the book, came out in 1951. Uh, so definitely, definitely worth spending the time to read if you haven't already, or read it again looking at this perspective. One, th one final comment on the book and the movie. Some of, I would say, it seems to me like a third of the lines in the movie are directly from the book. So whoever wrote that script did a good job because they basically, you know, took out some of the chaff in the middle and chunk, 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 lumped all the stuff in so that it was, you know, it was a pretty good reflection of the book. So anyway, as always, thank you very much for your time and I hope you have a great day.